So, good evening. Time for the press preview. It's our first look at Sunday's front pages. And tonight, we'll be taking a look at them and the headlines with the journalist and author, Rachel Shabby, and the editor of the Jewish Chronicle, Jake Wallace. Simon, it's great to see you this Saturday evening. We'll chat in a moment after we've had a look at some of those papers for you, beginning with the Sunday Mirror. We spoke about this a bit earlier in the bulletin. It's leading on that footage that it's obtained of an apparent Tory lockdown party with the headline, The Partygate Tapes. The Mail on Sunday's headline reads, Proof Boris Accuser did go to party in lockdown. The Sunday Express says, Get a grip, save the economy, reporting Conservative MPs have been told to stop infighting and focus on inflation while the row over party eight rumbles on. While The Observer says, Just an ex-MP as PM Rishi Sunak supporters pour scorn on Boris Johnson. Here's your Sunday Telegraph reporting that Sakir Starmer's chief of staff, Sue Gray, could have been suspended or sacked for a breach of impartiality rules had she not quit her posting. While the Sunday Times reports on Prince William's aim to end homelessness in the UK. And the Star features a story of a mum who claims she now remembers being taken by aliens 30 years ago. Mm. Uh, don't forget, you can scan the QR code that you see on screen. Join the programme, check out the front pages of tomorrow's papers while you watch us reviewing them. And to do that, Rachel Shabby and Jake Wallace-Simons. Uh, good to see you this Saturday night and lots to talk about in the Sunday papers. Rachel, why don't we start with the, uh, the Sunday Mirror? Um, it is quite an exclusive, this, isn't it? They're saying it's the first proper video of a Partygate party going on, lockdown busting parties that shamed the government. Um, now, we did know about this party, didn't we? And there had been photographs from it, but certainly we hadn't seen footage until now. That's right. So there have been photographs of this party before. This is on the 14th of December 2020. It's at Conservative HQ. So this is just before everybody cancelled their uh, Christmas plans or went into quite a strict lockdown over the Christmas period. There is something so visceral, though, about seeing this in video format. Um, it is sickening. It is absolutely sickening to watch this revelry at a time when lockdown was imposed. And in fact, there's you can hear someone in the video um, ask about the fact that it's being filmed and then say, you know, as long as we don't stream that we're like bending the rules, quote. So they knew exactly what they were doing. And the thing that is so maddening about it is the absolute disdain that it shows for everybody else in this country who was trying to do their best and trying to follow the rules. Um, of People who weren't seeing their loved ones, including loved ones who they then had to bury and weren't allowed to, to, to be with at that horrible time, uh, including the, the disdain for people who worked on the front lines, including healthcare, and the extraordinary, agonizing, dangerous work that they all did, the absolute contempt for people who were, you know, just trying to do their jobs or to just get through what was a horrendous period. And and the nail, the absolute nail that driven through the, the heart of people, that makes people feel so sick and maddened by this, is the fact that, you know, the people who were on the front lines um, and who we should be thanking for their service to this country during the pandemic are now on picket lines fighting for pay that is just not pulverised by inflation, while the people who completely disregarded the rules and have us, you know, such a disdain for the public are being rewarded. So, you know, Sean Bailey, who was at this party, got rewarded with a peerage. Um, ben Mallet, a Conservative campaigner, also at this party, uh, got an OBE, both from Boris Johnson. So that's the bit that really makes it so very maddening. Um, and, it, and it does make you think about all the people who uh, lost loved ones and went through the most agonizing circumstances during that period, um, only to have their, you know, salt rubbed in their wounds 
uh, by this video today. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it is, um, it is quite something, Jake, this video, isn't it? We know an investigation uh, happened. We know that Sean Bailey, who was the Conservative uh, London mayoral candidate, uh, fully apologised and, and stepped down. But do, do you think, now that we see the video, that the, the story moves on at all? Can anything else happen as a, as a result of it? Or is it simply a case of watching it, being shocked by it, and then, I guess, having to move on? Well, there could be an implication from the uh, emergence of the video, which is that when the police investigated this incident uh, last time, uh, the video wasn't available, and they were making judgments based on a couple of pictures. And as a result, they said they didn't have enough evidence to prove uh, a strong enough criminal case against the people in the picture. And the implication from the mirror story may be that the that this video may give them enough evidence to begin to bring charges against people who were at the party. It's not made explicit in the mirror story, but certainly the implication is there. Uh, but I take a slightly different view on it from Rachel. I mean, I, I, of course, I'm not condoning any of this, but I don't think that foremost in those people's minds in Tory HQ was contempt for the public. I think it was more a sense that the rules weren't really, A, weren't really worth following in their minds, um, and B, were too complicated to understand anyway. And I think that at that time, if you think about what else was going on in government, the Telegraph's lockdown files, those leaked messages from Matt Hancock showed, that around that time, he was seeking to, uh, I think his words were, deploy the new variant in, a, in PR terms to frighten the pants off the public, to soften them up for locking down over Christmas. And what it really brings home, I think, is that a lot of these rules that the government imposed upon the public uh, were unnecessary, were overly complicated and really infantilised people and took away their liberty to decide for themselves the level of their vulnerability and what was the best way to live their lives in accordance with the threat they perceived from the virus. I mean, you know, everybody watching this will have, have memories and, uh, and stories of not being able to sit on park benches or take dogs for walks or whatever, that were a totally absurd, uh, draconian and authoritarian measures imposed by the government, and often so complicated that we didn't even know what we weren't allowed to do. Uh, and clearly people inside Downing Street and inside CCHQ in London at this party were in the, in the same boat. They didn't mm. respect the rules because they knew they were over the top and this was the result. Although I guess you know, it, 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 it is easy with hindsight to, to say that, isn't it? I mean, I know at the time um, many people were suggesting that the rules were, uh, or some of the rules were, uh, uh, pointless. But, it, you, know, you know, we know a lot more now than we did back then. Um, Partygate is on the front of the mail as well, uh, Rachel. Um, uh, still rumbling on, of course, but this is a, a, a different story. The mail's still furious, isn't it, about the Privileges Committee findings and um, uh, they're taking aim at the what, what they call Boris Johnson's chief party gate inquisitor just to, just explain this story to us i will explain the story but i also think it's worth pointing out that you know the, the the mail i just think that any any newspaper that puts on its front page um in quote marks witch hunt over a privileges committee inquiry should not be sing signal boosted by us <laughs> on on broadcast news because it's because it's already part of a a very sort of dangerous destabilization of democratic norms. Um, and so I, I actually don't think this story is worthy of discussion. Um, what, it, what it is talking about is the fact that um, one, of the, one of the people who was sitting on that privileges committee, which was selected by the government and commissioned by the government and had a government majority on it, um, one of those people, uh, Sir Bernard Jenkin, he was apparently at a broke broke rules at a party of his own, and so uh, the Daily Mail is calling this an, an exclusive and, and further proof of what it considers to be a stitch up. Jake. Well, I, I profoundly disagree. I think this is very, very newsworthy indeed. Um, there certainly were elements of um, a witch hunt. Uh, I wouldn't personally go quite so far as the mail goes, but certainly, you know, a lot of the people on the panel of the Privileges Committee, including Harriet Harman, had gone public saying that they'd concluded that Boris had lied before they even began the uh, the inquiry. Uh, and that isn't isn't fair and right and impartial. Uh, and now we find out that Sir Bernard Jenkins, who's the most senior, senior Tory on the committee, himself apparently 
uh, broke the lockdown rules in exactly the same way and yet had the brass neck to uh, to take part in this inquiry, uh, scrutinising Boris Johnson's behaviour. And so I think the whole thing really is a very unedifying um, carnival of hypocrisy in, in all different directions, with people using the opportunity of the inquiry to settle scores uh, and to make political to score political points. Um, and nobody really comes out of it looking good or smelling of roses, uh, neither Boris nor the people who were launching the inquiry against him. Yeah, so having said that, it leads us very nicely, Rachel, doesn't it, onto the front of the Sunday Express. Is it time to put the Boris Johnson psychodrama behind us, put Partygate behind us, move on, because we need to focus on a lot of big issues, big problems that the country is facing? Yeah, absolutely. What I think is really interesting is that the three newspapers who are cheerleaders for the government, we've got one of them... Um, that is basically a Boris Johnson fan club and has just um, appointed him as a columnist for extraordinarily huge sums of money, the Daily Mail. So one of them saying, oh, well, the people who attack him are just as bad as him. And then we've got the Express saying, well, nothing to see here. Let's just move on. And then we've got the Telegraph, we'll see in a minute, with a rehash story about Sue Gray, which we'll talk about in a minute. And so this is the Express um, saying we should just get over this and have the government go back to talking about the economy. I actually do think that Boris Johnson is now a, a drain and a distraction um, from the business of government. But I actually think the entire Conservative government is a distraction from the business of government because they're the ones that keep getting caught up in this drama and this internal, incessant internal fighting uh, between the factions. So, you know, no great surprises there, really. Yeah, Joe, what, what, what do you think the public make of all this? What do the public make of these headlines day after day about Partygate, about Boris Johnson? Um, do you think there is still um, interest in it, interest in what, what went on in the past? Or do you think, like the Sunday Express, voters want us to move on? I think really there's a, a, a double instinct amongst the, part, uh, amongst the public. Uh, on the one hand, Boris is endlessly provocative and fascinating and controversial and people like thinking about him and reading about him and the Tory woes. It's a, it appeals to a sort of, uh, you know, tawdry instinct uh, to, to, you know, people wanting to watch this sort of slow motion Tory car crash. Uh, but at the same time, um, on a more serious note, people are worried about their standards of living and how far their or how, how, uh, how little distance their money is now stretching increasingly as time goes by. And with interest rates coming up next week up to 4.75%, you know, home repossessions are going up, businesses are beginning to fold, and the economic woes are really being felt hard by people. And everybody, I think, really, uh, above all, wants this to get better. And there's a real sense that the Tories are not focusing fully on the economy because they're too busy stabbing each other in the back, the front and the side again and again and again, and then doing it again. Mm. And so I think there is really an instinct that as entertaining and sort of tawdry as all this is, we do need, the, the government does need to begin to really focus exclusively on governing and mend the broken economy. Uh, front page of the Sunday Times. Uh, Jake, why don't you kick off uh, um, this part? And there's an exclusive interview here with uh, William where the Prince of Wales talks about using his own land for social housing. It's all part of a big push by him to try and end homelessness. It's interesting, isn't it, that uh, Prince William has chosen this particular cause to focus on right now. Uh, it's not a glamorous or sexy cause. It's homelessness in Britain. It's not, you know, elephants or landmines. It's it's people living on the street in our own country close to home. Um, and he's, you know, he's setting out his stall to try to end homelessness, as the headline says, which is a very, obviously, ambitious target. But bringing it down would help. Uh, and one of his um, proposals to do so is to set up social housing on his land, the Duchy of Cornwall land, to house homeless people. Obviously, this is a hugely virtuous and admirable uh, cause and proposal from uh, Prince William. And it just contrasts so starkly with the activities recently of his brother, who is 
uh, you know, um, engaged in this battle after battle in the courts with the media, uh, who's shamelessly self-promoting with regard to podcasts and uh, social media and all the rest of it, uh, and above all, um, taking pot shots at his own family in public. So I think the contrast between them is very, very stark indeed. And William is showing himself to be boring, but doing the right thing. And that's really what we need from our royal family. Boring, but doing the right thing. Uh, he's also released that photograph that's on the front of the Sunday Times uh, this evening uh, for Father's Day. Whatever you think of the royal family, Rachel, it is a, a cute photo, isn't it? George 9, Charlotte 8, Louis um, on his shoulders there, that photo taken at Windsor. Uh, the Prince saying, uh, Rachel, that he wants to particularly target hidden youth homelessness. That, um, that phrase sofa surfing comes up a lot, doesn't it? Yeah, I think that, that he's right about that. There is a lot of hidden um, youth homelessness that is, is couched, uh, no pun, in, in these terms. There is also a lot of youth homelessness on the streets. We can see, we can see that. Um, first of all, we can see with our own eyes that homelessness has increased in the UK. And we can also see that, that there are a, a, a terrifying, really alarming um, number of young people on the streets as well. Um, rough sleepers. Uh, it's it's great uh, that um, Prince William wants to raise awareness of this. I think it's very important that someone like him speaks about, you know, understanding uh, the circumstances in which people um, end up sleeping rough and trying to destigmatize that. But it does make you think, you know, he says he wants to end homelessness. Well, I mean, that's great, but it's actually the government's job. So it does make you wonder why the government isn't doing it. Yes, we need social housing. Uh, we need the government to be doing that. We need the government to be committing to that, which, by the way, would also be a huge job creation program. So it does, to me, um, shine a light rather starkly on, on the government's failure in this department. Mm. OK, you can read more uh, in Sunday Times from William. Let's move on to the front of the Observer. Jake, uh, schools in England are struggling to recruit English teachers. This story coming, of course, as uh, more strikes are announced today. Yes, it's interesting, this. I, uh, apparently, uh, English teachers are normally the easiest to recruit, and it's normally uh, in the other uh, subjects, maths and sciences, that schools experience difficulties in attracting uh, staff, but now even English teachers are difficult to to find as well. And I think that really this speaks about the um, the collapse, the denigration of English as a discipline uh, in Britain. We've had an increasing focus on the STEM subjects, as they're called, maths and sciences, because they're seen to be more economically worthwhile. Um, and English and the arts have been consistently sidelined as we substitute uh, our ideals of pursuing knowledge. Uh, for its own sake, for the goodness of, of our nation, for a more commercially driven approach towards education. And to me, that's a great, great shame. Uh, and combined, as you say, with the uh, teacher strikes, which are continuing, more coming this week, I think we really are uh, doing a great disservice to the next generation. Yeah, it's interesting with, with, with the strikes, um, isn't it, Rachel? Because uh, the unions are saying it's not just about pay. Obviously, pay is a big part of it, but it's all about uh, these issues that Jake's just talked about as well. Recruitment, uh, funding, um, uh, it, that is as, as important to teachers today as their pay is. Of course. Um, part of the issue with uh, uh, recruitment is, that, is precisely that. It's low pay. It's the fact that teachers are so overworked. Um, it's pressures of being sort of over, over sort of inspected potentially, um, and just having much more admin work to do, leaving less time for teaching, which is what you know vocationally teachers are driven to do. So I don't think that what Jake is suggesting is right. I think what I'm reading from this article is that uh, recruitment has become bad or has been bad for some time amongst in other uh, for areas like math science etc and now the recruitment and the shortages have become so acute that they're actually leaching into and bleeding into 
and extending outwards into areas where traditionally there have been fewer shortages. So I think it points to the scale of the crisis. And you've got people uh, from the education union in this piece saying they're not using the term crisis lightly, but it also, of course, underlines why they are absolutely right to be striking uh, for fairer pay and better conditions. Because mm. if they don't get pay that is at the very least in line with inflation, then how on earth are they going to recruit more staff? 